Welcome to the, uh, the first session of the day, which is evaluating IA, AI, so I'll start again, evaluating AI, how data science and statistics can shape the UK's AI strategy. Um, I think about five years ago, I thought AI was going to be the most sort of commonly used phrase over the next uh, few years, and I think that turned out to be the case. And AI is absolutely ubiquitous these days. Um, and it's actually really hard to remain, remain on top of all the developments that are happening and including all the guidance that is coming out from various organizations. But it is important for the RSS to have a voice and to be part of the debate as it cuts across many of our areas. It cuts across data, ethics, methodology, risk, and, and a whole host of other things. And I think the, the RSS is well placed in the sense that it has a number of sections that um, work with with uh, in, in, in this data, data science AI space. So we have the data and ethics section, we have the data science and AI section, and we have computational stats and machine learning section. And we have certainly representatives of two of those sections here today. Uh, we also have data science accreditation, real world data science platform, and we're producing a data science journal. So it touches an awful lot of parts of the organization. I do think RSS genuinely responds to uh, guidelines in a measured way, and it's interesting that um, the recent white paper that was produced by the government, the UK government, mentioned proportionality, I think, over 50 times. So I think we're certainly into that. Let's be proportionate, let's be measured in, in our response. Um, but it is quite interesting, isn't it? Because on the one hand, people will say things are transformational, on the other hand, it's going to be the death of us all. Um, and I think to some extent, I've always felt you need to be an evangelist and a cynic at the same time. So it, there's a lot of issues around the AI space. Um, and what I'd like to do is to introduce Jonathan Everett, who's going to come on in, in, in a minute. And he's going to basically, get, he's done a lot of work from policy, uh, from the policy group in, in, in HQ. Um, on some of these guidance, so he's pulled together a lot of that information. He's going to give an overview. Um, we've also got Brian Tarran, who's from the Real World Data Science Platform, and he's going to pick up some of the questions that you ask using the app, which I think worked, worked pretty well yesterday. So you'll see Brian and you'll see Jonathan. Um, but we have five panel members here today, um, and we'll go through in a little bit more detail and get to introduce themselves later. But we've got Sophie Carr, who's founder of Bayes Consulting and chair of the Real World Data Science Editorial Board. We've got Chris Nemeth, Professor in Statistics at Lancaster University, and chair of the RSS Computational Statistics and Machine Learning section. We have Maxine Setuan, who is a Senior Consultant in Data Science, Trusted AI, Ernst & Young. We have Karen Tinge, the Principal Statistical Methodologist, Methodology and Quality Directorate for the Office of National Statistics, and a lead for the Government Text Data Subcommunity. And Peter Wells, technologist and policy at projects by IF, a member of the RSS Data Science and Ethics Governance section. So, uh, Jonathan, I'm going to ask you to come up and uh, um, summarize our, our policy views. Thank you. Hello. Um, yes, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of how the RSS sort of approaches our policy work in this area. Um, so our, our job as a membership body is to represent the view of our members. So in the policy function at the RSS, we spend a lot of our time speaking to our members, working out what their views are, and thinking about how we can sort of agree a consensus position that we're confident the bulk of the membership will be happy with. Um, when we're doing this, we're always trying to find sort of a couple of key points that are sort of catchy enough to be interesting to government and the media that are easily communicable and where our reputation as a learning society with expertise in the area sort of adds authority and seems relevant to the conversation. So um, for our work on AI, we've been primarily working with our data science section and our data ethics and governance section. Um, and we've been working with them to develop um, this couple of key points. Um, so the two key points that we've worked up with these sections are um, to call for a center for AI evaluation and to call for funding for um, more open source development. So I'll give you a bit of background on 
why we're calling for those particular, um, why we're making those particular recommendations and the problems that we're hoping that they will um, address and help solve. So first, the Centre for AI Evaluation. So there we've been primarily working with the data ethics and governance section. And um, Peter is a member of that section who's been sort of very helpful in developing these sort of policy asks. Um, so um, one of the key issues that we've seen with the AI is around evaluation. So the difficulty um, of getting insight into the strengths and weaknesses and behaviors of the different models. And now, I'm sure everyone here knows that that's going to be particularly tricky because when you are evaluating AI, you want to be proportionate and context sensitive. But at the same time, there are a lot of questions that you need to ask of AI models. So some of the sort of key things that we've been, picked out, been picking out are identifying the existing metrics are very narrow and task specific, and that they can often overlook the broader performance of AI models. Um, there's no standardized evaluation methods across AI systems, which means that you sort of can't compare consistency, consistently and you risk drawing misleading conclusions. Um, and another problem that we sort of see is that when models are rolled out or products are rolled out, they're evaluated sort of one-off pre-launch and then don't really get looked at again. So we need to think about how you do continuous evaluation of AI models. And another area where we think we sort of have particular strength is around communication. Um, it's something that statisticians and data scientists are skilled at, sort of communicating to complex issues. And there is a lot of complexity in communication around AI. Um, so you need to give different, method, uh, different messages to developers of products, to users of products, and to regulators. And there's a challenge around communication there too. And these are all things that we would like to see um, a new Center for AI Evaluation address. Um, so, yeah, so and the, the point that we're trying to make to government is that the challenge around AI is of the same sort of urgency as the challenge of evaluation of healthcare devices was in the 1990s. And then in the, in the 1990s, this was responded to with a um, new body in NHS R&D Health Technology Assessment Program which sort of invested in, evaluate, invested in evaluation and sort of generally seen as a successful organization and program. And I hope that a Center for AI evaluation could be similar. So that is a point that um, we're sort of really trying to push. Um, the other part of our ask on this has been sort of developed with the data science section. Um, so they, for, well, I say a long time, since 2020, um, the data science section have been arguing that the coming challenge, the big challenge of AI, was scaling up sort of large language models so that the UK could be competitive with the US and China. So that the data science section has been making that point for a long time, in the con at least in the context of policy, is not something that a lot of people with policy hats on have been talking about. And that's sort of come to, it's come sort of the attention of policymakers in the last year or so with the importance of large language models and generative AI. Um, but that the data science section has been making that point for a couple of years, gives us a level of authority on the subject. Um, so we're, we're trying to make the point now that investing in open source development is an important thing for the UK to be doing. Um, so that's, uh, we're asking for quite a large sum of money for that now, we've sort of agreed about a 250 million pound ask of government over three years to invest in a government um, unit of open source developers um, and to sort of create an open source fund that industry can bid into and to sort of invest in increasing compute power and building data sets. Um, so we're making quite a, a large ask of government there. Um, and, but I, hopefully it's, um, manageable sum of money, and it's a, it's a topic that is increasingly on the mind of government, so there's a good opportunity to be pushing for it. So when we've developed these asks, we then sort of have to think about how we communicate them and how we try to bring about the changes. So part of that is responding to government consultations. So um, a few months ago now, the government released its AI white paper, so we developed our response to that, where we made these, made these points directly to government, 
as well as sort of providing specific <coughs> feedback on their proposals for regulation. Um, and that more recently, there was a House of Lords Select Committee inquiry into larger language models that we put evidence into yesterday. So there's, there's sort of reactive responding to um, consultations and inquiries when they come up. Um, in terms of next steps, we sort of have we have an eye on um, the AI summit at the end of the year, and there will likely be opportunities to sort of push for these points around then. Um, and I think that there's likely to be an election next year as well. And my understanding is that um, that these issues are relevant to voters. I've even heard some people tell me that voters are talking to them about talking to them about it on the doorstep when they go door knocking to ask them like, what's on their mind. So it's clearly it's clearly something that sort of politicians are going to be thinking about. So over the next year or so, I think there's going to be lots of opportunity for us to be making these points and to try to make change. And so I'm I'm very interested to sort of hear this discussion, hear people's points, and think about how we can be effectively taking them forward over the next year or so. Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you, Jonathan. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to introduce each of the panel members, and each one of them are going to um, have an opening statement, and then we'll get onto some set questions, and then we'll open up for a broader, broader Q and A. So, um, in in random order, perhaps, or, or this is where it was given to me anyway. I'm going to start with Peter Wells. So Peter Wells is a technologist who accidentally started a second career in public policy. He has both worked on AI policy and helped design AI-enabled services. After 20 years in the telecoms industry, he, founded, he found himself spending in 2014 developing digital government policy for the Labour Party. Since then, he's worked with multiple governments and organizations, including the Open Data Institute, projects by IF, Google, Meta, and the Government for Digital Service. So Peter, I'd just like an opening statement from you, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. And I'm hoping this is coming through okay. It looks like it is, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, thank you for coming along today. I'm sure that's already been said, I'm sure everybody else will say it too, but it gives me a bit of time just to get my thoughts in order again mm. and get my mouth working. Uh, so, so just a couple of thoughts. So one is, uh, what, is, what actually is AI right now? So a few years ago when I first started working on AI policy, it was machine learning. That's developed out into reinforcement learning, various other techniques. Over the last year, we've certainly seen large language models and foundation models, but we've also seen uh, artificial general intelligence, or AGI, be captured into the, or be brought into the AI bucket. So lots of the work that's going on around AI around the world and in government's head around AI includes that potential of artificial general intelligence. The, I know myself, when I think of AI, I think of like five main components, people, compute power, algorithms, data, and money because you need money to make those other things actually happen. The, you might have people working for free, but you're not going to get computers working for free unless you've got some free electricity somewhere and some free hardware. The, and then the third bit is that AI gets embedded into systems, product, services, and processes. So if we put to one side the AGI, this potentially sentient machines that can act on their own, we're taking the acts on algorithms. People are designing them, they're using them, they're building them into processes, systems, uh, services on our phones, and that process and that act is also really important. So when I, I suppose when I think of the, the two key topics that Jonathan mentioned, the Centre for AI Evaluation and the Open Source Unit, that, that evaluation needs to be useful. You know, what's the impact on society and people that are going to be using the algorithm? Is it compliant with the law? It's really hard to tell right now. Are we actually building these things in ways that are compliant with the law, let alone is that impact compliant with the law? inside our current legal and regulatory frameworks. But we also need to be evaluating them and providing guidance for the people doing the embedding. And so the people who are using, take, picking up bits of AI and building services, what information do they need to actually do something useful? And they're probably going to be in a more specific context than the people building the AI models, particularly these more general ones. So that's where, I suppose, some of the old analogies like the health technology assessment, that's at the embedding stage rather than necessarily rather than always the development stage of the, the core model. And then on, just on the open source piece, I think we need to be a little bit wary that about only doing open source and only doing the software pieces, because that's only tackling one piece of the AI puzzle. It's not really going to be, whatever the goal of open source might be democratizing or opening up for scrutiny, it's not really tackling those other pieces. So we really need to be looking a bit at some of the other 
skills and capabilities that peop more people will need to build and use and handle AI systems. I think that's where we'll, that kind of conversation will get to in the future. That's me. Great. Thank you, Peter. So I'm going to ask you a quick question. Either you can, uh, you can either give one or you can only give one answer to this. So AI transformational or will it be the death of us? <laughs> uh, well, the death of us is a transformation, so I'm going for transformation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Dr. Sophie Carr. So Sophie is founder and owner of Bayes Consulting, a data science uh, company. Having trained as an aeronautical engineer, Sophie completed her PhD in Bayes and analysis part-time while she worked and following mm -hmm. redundancy formed her own company. She's VP, VP for Education and Statistical Literacy at the RSS and sits on the executive committee for the Academy of Mathematical Sciences and the International Center for Mathematical Sciences. She's also currently the world's most interesting mathematician, so no, uh, <laughs> no pressure there, Sophie. So opening statement from you, please. Thank you, um, and I'm really glad I went second because you've said a lot of the things I was thinking about. But I guess having listened to Jonathan, I have two hats in, in, in answering this. Firstly, as the, the VP for Statistical um, Literacy and Education, my concern when we talk about any form of AI, whatever you think that is, which has gone from machine learning to, to further, is how do we as statisticians and a community reach out and engage with the general population? Because the only way that AI is going to be transformative for good is if everybody is involved in that conversation. So people understand the impact of what's being developed, how it's going to affect them, and whatever metrics and numbers that are used to explain this AI and algorithms, how do they interpret them, what does it mean? And that is not to say that everybody has to become an amazing statistician, Part of it falls on us to become much better communicators, to say to people, this is why you need to care. This is why you need to know about um, driverless cars. This is what the algorithms do. Now, extending that out a little bit further and talking about the, the center um, that Jonathan mentioned and, and, and open source, looking at the center, if we're going to try and come up with metrics to evaluate AI, there absolutely is a place where there are some common metrics maybe on, on transparency, and even Ian Diamond gave some, some examples when he talked on Monday. But if we think of it from statistics, I don't know many people, truthfully, who can explain whether you want a model to be best at AUC or precision recall, and which model do you need to choose. So actually we need to maybe have a range of metrics, but those metrics have to be developed by a diverse group of people. Because if we have a diverse group of people coming up with the metrics, we have a much better chance of making sure that the algorithms we're developing don't fall into those trips of bias and don't fall um, into disproportionately affecting certain portions. When we look at open source, again, coming from the statistical literacy point of view, I think there's an amazing opportunity to widen participation. So if there is the money behind this, and we can actually open up um, algorithm development, I'm not going to say I in that sense, that more and more people can find it accessible and work in it and see themselves in that field, then again we start to develop a world where everybody becomes um, involved and understands what is being developed. Thank you, Sophie. So again, you can only answer one here. Evangelist or skeptic are you? Oh, evangelist. Great. Thank you. Okay. We move on to Maxime uh, Setuan, is a data scientist specializing in AI and data risk and trusted AI at Ernst Young UK, uh, UK and Ireland, I guess that is. She works to help clients in various industries assess and manage risks from analytics and AI systems and implement AI governance to ensure AI systems are implemented with fair, accountable, and trustworthy principles. She combines her socio-technical -techn background with an MSc in social, social data science from the University of Oxford and her experience working in data science with consulting firms. So, Maxime, over to you. Thank you. Um, so, this is coming okay, I'm pursuing. Um, so, I resonate with a lot of the points that Jonathan mentioned earlier, and from what I've seen in practice and industry, there are different definitions of what good AI looks like. And when you have differences in what you think a good AI looks like, what definition of AI looks like, it's very hard to start regulating AI. So I think there's a really big need for this consensus of good 
practices, best practices and gold standards to make sure that we have safeguards across AI systems that we implement across society and make sure that we don't implement things that could go wrong, knowing how to know if things go wrong. So I think within if the umbrella term of AI evaluation, um, within consulting, there are three things that we think. Um, that it's always the points that we need to think about. The first is how do we know that the AI model is working? Second is how do we trust the AI model? And the third and the most important thing, like how do we continue to trust the model? Um, the differences with an AI model and the rule-based systems is that the way that the system is made, it's probabilistic and it doesn't always have the same output as you think it would be um, in normal technology systems. So that's um, where the need of consensus from statisticians, society, policymakers, um, data scientists as well, academia. And then within the open source um, point, there is a huge opportunity there to tackle the bias challenge um, and the underrepresented groups within data science and um, AI community with open source, if there's funding and there's the push for that. Um, um, the advantages of that is that it's very quick to adapt to things, and especially within AI and AI regulation, everything's moving at a very fast pace. So that's um, something that would definitely help the AI regulation and um, making sure that um, regulations is regulating what it should be regulating, not just having that as like um, um, something in the government. And then um, we can think about this, like uh, within geospatial analysis, there's the open street map. Um, that's one of the most um, good example of what open source would look like because it is not owned by anyone, but it's one of the most successful maps in the world because there's a lot of providers and contributors even in the um, areas in the world that's not reachable. For example, in um, the Haiti earthquake, a lot of the contributors and volunteers start to map things out around the island in about a few days. Um, and within a few days, they have a whole map of an island from nothing. So that is the power of open source and we can use that within AI and data science. It's the same um, mindset of how we can think about evaluating metrics or think about areas we might not think about from RSS, for example, but other parts of the world could have an idea to contribute to you. Great, thank you. Um, so, question for you, chat GPT, five years, will it still be around, yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Right, we move on to uh, Chris ne Nemeth, uh, who's a professor of statistics at Lancaster University. His primary research area is probabilistic machine learning and computational statistics. He holds an EPSRC funded Turing AI fellowship on probabilistic algorithms the scalable and computable approaches to learning. Um, and through his fellowship, he works closely with partners including Shell, Tesco, El Silvia, uh, Microsoft, Alan Turing Institute, and is chair of the Royal Statistical Society section on computational statistics and machine learning. Over to you, Chris. Um, thank you. Can you hear me in the back? Um, so I think the first thing to mention about the AI evaluation or how it evolves in terms of regulation is that it's a very, very fast moving field. So you talk to lots of organizations and their AI strategy now is completely different to what it was 12 months ago. And you sort of see this, I think, already when you look at the government's AI white paper. I think the government had this view initially that we're going to be pro-innovation and we're going to try and undercut the EU and not have as much regulation. Um, but within sort of six months, the government has very quickly done a 180 and now the prime minister would like the UK to be the sort of AI regulator of the world, let's say. And so there's going to be a summit later this year. So things do change very, very quickly. Um, and I think if you look at other parts of the world and where they're already doing sort of AI regulation, I think at the moment the EU are probably way ahead of anybody else. And I think if you look at what the EU are doing, I think most of us would probably agree actually they have quite a good approach to this. Um, so the EU have been working on this for about five years and their approach is about risk assessment, okay? Which is actually what the RSS talk a lot about in their response to the AI white paper as well. So the EU's view is that if something is very, very risky, so for example, if you're using AI for facial recognition or to uh, discriminate against people, then that's a complete no-no. Um, if you're using AI in situations where it be say healthcare, then that will require more regulation than say if you're using AI for say art. 
Okay, so the more risky the situation is, the more regulation will be required, which seems quite sensible. So I think the EU are sort of ahead of us, probably, in that sense, and they seem to be heading in quite a reasonable direction. Um, the fact that the tech companies hate it means that they're probably doing the right thing. Um, but I think there's not going to just be one AI regulation to rule them all. I think what we're going to have to move into is this realm where there are different types of regulation depending on the context. So the regulation that you would use for AI in the NHS is going to be quite different to what you would use for regulation of, say, driverless cars, let's say, or AI in the military. So I think whilst it sort of makes sense to have an AI bill, I think actually what's going to happen is that it's going to have to feed down into individual departments and it's going to become much more um, related to specific applications. Um, the final point I would make, and it's kind of the obvious one given that we're all you know, statisticians, data scientists here, and that is statisticians have a huge role to play here, and we're not, basically. I think at the moment, I think the debate around AI is being very heavily led by computer scientists and around the sort of Silicon Valley sort of crowd. But when you look at what AI essentially is, it's taking large amounts of data, throw it into a big computer, and you get out some answers, right? And if you look at what actually leads to the best improvement in terms of these AI systems, it's really the data, right? The data that goes in, how you understand that data, how you structure that data, how you pre-process -pre that data. But the data is a hugely important part. And we, as you know, data experts, I think, should have a much more active role um, in sort of evaluating and coming up with the metrics that should be used for these sorts of systems. Thank you. OK, so a question for you. In five years' time, I'm off to the RSS conference. Okay. In, Where is it? Uh, um, let's say it's in Aberdeen again. Let's say it's a long way away. Let's go Aberdeen. Um, will I be using a driverless car to get there? Oh, that's a good question. I think yes. Okay. Thank you. I'll say, can I say one more thing on that? I'll say, I'm saying yes simply because if you look at how successful it's being in San Francisco right now, I think it probably will be here in five years. Great. Thank you. Right, over to Karen Tinge, is a principal statistical methodologist at ONS, where she specializes in nat national, sorry, natural language processing, maybe even national as well, I don't know, and in managing, <laughs> and in managing complex survey imputation. She established and heads up the text data subcommunity, a large network of public sector analysts to build capability and best practice guidance in managing and analyzing unstructured text data on behalf of the government data science community. She sits on several cross-government and international working groups on responsible use of generative AI. So over to you, Karen. Thanks. Um, I was thinking, you're, if you're looking for a diverse range of views, I don't think you have them. I think we have fairly consistent <laughs> views across the board. <laughs> um, um, I've been very pleased at how quickly the conversation has gone from, can we use, I talk, I will, be referring a lot to um, large language models because that's my, that's where my head is at the moment. Um, how quickly the conversation has gone from can we use ChatGPT for this to should we use ChatGPT for this, or how do we know that we are using this ChatGPT appropriately and effectively? Um, and the conversations that I'm being part of are around this responsible use of AI. Um, there is a lot of discussion around not wanting to be too prescriptive around the use of AI, especially for a variety of organizations. Um, as Chris alluded to, you know, how you use AI in different settings is going to, is going to vary, and what is appropriate in one use is, isn't going to be appropriate in another. Um, so there is a lot of discussion at the moment around informed use. And providing people with the information that they need in order to ensure, in order to evaluate not just the outputs, but whether their use case is appropriate. And that's something that I'm, I'm very interested in, um, in seeing from RSS. I would also perhaps disagree with the analogy of AI uh, in relation to health devices. Um, I see it more as, analogous to the internet. So it will be as ubiquitous. We already can see that it, it's there. We don't know that it's there. We don't know that we are. Um, my brain's gone dead. <laughs> and I can't think of the word. Um, that we are using or that we are using AI or that AI is embedded in, in some of the systems that we're interacting with. Interacting, that was the word that I was looking for. Um, 
but it's providing people, providing not just the users, whether the users is the public or the analysts themselves, providing them with the information and the training that they need in order to use this safely and interact with this safely, both in terms of what I'm reading, how accurate is this, how can I find out how accurate that is, but also as an analyst, how, how do I make the decisions to use this tool over another tool, but also the organizations, and how, how well does our use of AI fit with our organizational values? So yeah, that's going to be a really interesting one over the next few years, or few months, because it's moving quickly. Great. Thank you very much. So I want to go back to the, uh, the, the previous, previous question. So evangelist or cynic? Can I say cynical evangelist? You can. You okay. can. <laughs> thank you. Natural cynic, <laughs> but hopeful. So thank you very much for your, for your opening statement. So we're now just going to move on to, to some of the, the questions. So we're going to start with about evaluating I, uh, AI. Um, so which aspects of AI models or systems should we be focusing on and why in terms of evaluation? So who would like to kick that off? Maybe Peter, would you like to kick that off? <laughs> That's the toughest one because it depends what we're evaluating for, which in which context. The, so for me right now, the, the thing that most concerns me in the context I work in is evaluating these models, evaluating AI systems, which are mostly large language models right now for the ones that people are trying working out can they use and how they use it, is evaluating them for, evaluating them so as to be able to give to a team who is building it into a product the information they need to build a trustworthy product. So people are, people are I could go to someone like Hugging Face, I can see 100 different models available to use, which one should I use for a particular task, and how will I need to adapt it so a user, an analyst, a consumer can understand what's happening when they need to understand what's happening. And that's a really, really hard challenge, bridging that gap. So for me, that's a key point of valuation to start to get to that point where we can help people build more trustworthy services and from that we can learn what their needs are evaluating as they start to experiment with those services. Mm -hmm. If that's helpful at all, but I need to draw pictures now. <laughs> Does anybody else like to comment on that, about what, what should we be evaluating? What we should be focusing on? I, I would like to jump in. Um, I think we often, in the term data science, we often forget the data. The, and we jump straight to the method. But the data underpins the success of the method. And we're not yet looking enough at how is the data being stored? How is it being accessed? How do we know that the data is accurate in itself? And all of that underpins how we, how the method works, and how we evaluate the outputs. So it's a really, a really interesting point, and and so um, there is a lot of focus on outputs, um, and inputs maybe haven't received as, as as much as much attention, and and so you know with generative AI, large language models, you do get into things like copyright, for instance. Mm. Um, and privacy and, and all those sort of access. So does, has anybody got any thoughts around, around the, the input um, aspects of how you evaluate input? I mean, are, are you even allowed to, to have those inputs that are being used at the moment in, in large language models? Any thoughts around, around the inputs? Everyone's gonna pause, I can come in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come on. <laughs> Go for it. From, from an open. Go back to World Open Data Institute days. The, so I think data, data is a really important input, but it is only one input. So we need to be wary of the other inputs which are taking place, like the people deciding which data to use or weighting the algorithms or choosing which algorithm to use. But I think around that data, I think we'll generally find that most of the stuff that is being done is probably legal. The, it might be stretching the law in some cases, it may not be aligned with the intent of the law, or the, certainly not aligned with the expectations of some of the people who feel they have rights or ownership over the data that's being used. But it looks like it actually could well be legal right now what's been done with that data. I think there's certainly a gap around uh, transparency of what data is going into the current models. So what that data is, what the characteristics are of that data, where it's coming from, that would be incredibly helpful to know more about what's happening there. So OpenAI, so we mentioned ChatGPT earlier. Famously, OpenAI's latest uh, GPT-4 model, they did not publish the information around the data that went into that particular model because they thought 
they thought that would make it too easy for people to build artificial general intelligences was their argument, so they chose not to do it. But it's probably for commercial reasons. But we need more transparency on that to really get a grip of what's going on. But it looks like it's probably within the letter of the law, if not the intent. And even, even if so, if you put something to chat GPT and say, I don't know, write me a, a song about the RSS conference in the style yeah. of the Beatles, yeah. do you think they have accessed the information about the Beatles um, in a, a lawful, copyrighted way? Type of thing? I think by the letter, yes, by the intent, tricky. Mm. The, I could listen to songs of the Beatles and write a terrible pastiche. Oasis did it for years. <laughs> the, that's controversial. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> always one of the controversial I mean, panels. It also shows our age. <laughs> yeah. When I'm doing it at scale, that changes some of the things. When I'm doing it to create significant amounts of money or to take money away from other people, because often we don't talk about the, 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 the labor rights that goes into some of that data or the labor rights of the people labeling the data as well to actually make it understandable by the machines. But I think you know, it's a tricky area that where as societies we need to have decent debates and we'll, decent debates and change our answers a few times for the next 20 years before, before settling on it for the next 50 or so. Yeah, okay. Has that generated any thoughts on, on inputs from anybody else? Coming to um, his points on commercial um, areas of looking at the data and the inputs. One of the challenges within the business is, again, um, competitive advantage. So people don't want to show what their model looks like, what their data looks like. It counts as their intellectual property. And one of the ways to audit AI is to look at their data, um, look at the distribution of what their data that goes into the training data, because how fair a model would um, produce is based on the fairness and the distribution of the training data. Um, and one of the, again, like what you mentioned, um, they're doing a legal ways of using um, personal data, for example, they have consent from people, but then you don't know how the um, different distributions of various groups, for example, that you use in these protected um, attributes within the models could produce unfairness outputs. Um, and that's exactly what you should look into when we want to evaluate AI, um, especially if the model is touching upon sensitive attributes um, like race or like even proxy for race like postcodes, for example. How fair is the distribution of the training data is one of the main points, I would say. Yeah, I mean, fairness is a very inter <laughs> interesting concept. It's, uh, it's very actually hard to tie down as, as a lot of things are in, in AI. So, Sophie? So it was, it was just building on something you slightly said. When you start looking at the data, I think one of the things we've slightly missed on the evaluation is doing it in the wild. There's a very big difference be coming up with the metrics about the data that you have in a beautiful, perfect lab, albeit the data might not be perfect, and then pushing it out into the ether and seeing what people do with it, because a lot of the things that were rapidly de developed off the initial chat GPT probably weren't imagined. I think that's part of the problem when you, you unleash this. What you evaluate mm. in a lab or a research environment is not what you're going to see when you push it out. And then you find the bugs and, and the flaws in, in what you've actually done. And I think that's probably worth remembering that we need maybe different sets of evaluations when it goes live. Yeah. I was just going to make the point. What's interesting, I guess, with the question of is the data accessed legally, kind of what Peter was saying. It seems like it's all quite legitimate, what's been done so far, maybe. Um, but the good thing is it makes us as uh, sort of consumers much more aware of this. And so as we've seen with sort of GDPR about opting into and opting out of various things, I think we might end up seeing more of this now because we are much more aware now that G ChatGPT is taking my data and it's using it to make money. So we've seen recently in the mathematics community, for example, where people put their papers on archive, they started to change the Creative Commons license that they're using because there's one which is like, hey, you can do whatever you want with it, and there's another license which says you can use it but not for commercial purposes. So ChatGPT takes my paper and then uses it to make money, then what, should I allow that? I don't know. I, mean, that's, I think that's an interesting question for all of us. But then when you look at the other side, you can say, well, I don't want to give any of my data away. I want to keep all my data to myself. But then, of course, all the benefits of AI come from having these large data sets available. So if we do want AI to find a cure for cancer, for example, then we're going to have to give it our data. So I think there's going to be an interesting sort of debate about how much data do we give and who are we willing to give that data to. Right, I'm going to swap a little, switch a little bit now around to, to, to maybe the outputs. And, and Chris, you, you talked a little bit about risk. 
and uh, I guess there's the aspects of sort of human oversight of, of, of these things. So I'd be interested to, to get your views on, on evaluation there. So, uh, you know, some, some algorithms, um, you know, will recommend, some will decide, some, some generative AI is there just to entertain. I mean, how do you evaluate it in terms of a risk, doing a risk assessment? What are you, what are you, what's your thinking there? Um, I mean, it's hard, I guess. I mean, if you talk about driverless cars, for example, like what would be the way to assess it? You'd say, well, maybe uh, this driverless car is driven for 1,000 hours and it has crashed a certain number of times, and that's far less than the average human. And that seems to me maybe a reasonable thing to say, that we would allow this driverless car to be on the road as long as it's 10 times better than a human, for example. But then the risk that you apply to drive this car is going to be quite different to the risk that you would apply for, as you say, generative AI for art. My feeling is that what's actually going to happen in terms of the risk assessment, it's all going to get determined by insurance companies. At the end of the day, whether it's a medical device or it's a driverless car, an insurance company are going to have to um, put some probability on the risk of this. And it'll be insurance companies, I think, who will be the ones to sort of decide, in some sense, what the regulation will be. And we've seen this already with um, insurance, if you buy home insurance, for example. I mean, there are sort of machine learning models under the hood there, but the only reason they're allowed to be used is because they're explainable in some way. The insurance company can say, yes, we gave you this insurance quote because of X, Y, and Z. And explainability is going to be the important part, I think, when it comes to how you would use, say, driverless cars. That if there is an accident, can you explain why the car did this and not something else? And we saw this recently with the air traffic control situation in the UK, and the report came out today about what may have caused that issue. So it has to be explainable. If it's not explainable, then insurance companies won't insure it, and if insurance companies won't insure it, then you're sort of stuck. So I think, um, but then that leads into a very difficult position for the uh, big tech companies because they're not going to tell you how their models work. That's their property. So I think how you can evaluate models without actually seeing the model, it's a very interesting statistical question. Um, I don't know the answer. And is, is there, I mean, a dis I mean, AI is such a broad topic. I mean, is there a distinction there between um, systems that have human oversight and ones that are essentially a a autonomous? And, and, and when we talk about AI now, do you think mostly people are talking about autonomous systems as opposed to ones with human oversight? So, um, Maxine, so not, not you had any, thought, any thoughts? Yeah, so um, the first thing that popped to my mind is, again, the difference between rule-based system and AI system. The, difference, the biggest difference is that rule-based system, once you have risk assessment over um, a software that you code by rule, once you know that A produced B, it will always produce B. So that's kind of like a checklist done. But with AI systems, the way that risk management work is um, continuous monitoring. So the areas that you need to think about within AI is um, have you, it's not like have A produce B, but have you checked A, B, C, D with the system? Have you done your monitoring? Uh, how often is your retraining, for example? And what are the risk tier for your models? Which model is the highest risk in terms of outputs, for example? Or um, who will be responsible for monitoring the validation tests and whatever? Um, so that kind of question is how we in the firm um, do risk assessments for AI systems. It's not easy, as um, you said, but um, metrics are a tool that you can use to see if they're actually doing it but there has to be governance and processes and people accountable for these to make sure that these risks are mitigated and managed. Absolutely. Sophie? So I think I agree with everything you said, but I think there's also a conversation we need to have, and, and that is, in my world, consulting like you, people will come and say, I want a cutting edge AI project. And you go, okay, do you realize that AI doesn't do what you're asking it to do? There's machine learning, or there's this thing called statistics that will probably get you part of, well, actually all of the way to what you want. They're like, oh, no, no, I don't want a statistics project, I want a cutting edge AI project. <laughs> I've got money, funding for cutting edge AI projects, give me one. And then we go to the risk conversation of, okay, I can run you whatever model is appropriate, deep learning or reinforcement or whatever it is. But I need now to tell you that it's not wholly explainable. Whoa, 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 I want my project to be totally explainable. I have to, I have to say what changes. And then we have to have this conversation about the risk. And I think a lot of it then boils down to not that the money they may have got for this AI project, but what are they prepared to put in to understand the risk mm -hmm. and how are they then going to use the tool at the end? And I think that's a conversation that has to be had more openly up front before people go and just put forward projects that have got AI in the title because they get funded. 
So just just picking up on on, on that a little bit about it, um, you know making an assessment. So I, I I work in drug development, and you know when when you get a drug on the market, that's not the end of the the process. So you you know you get you accumulate data over a period of time. In fact, until you take the drug off the market. So any thoughts that that you, anybody might have about evaluating AI AI across the whole life cycle of the system or the product. And um, maybe, I know you were, maybe you, you were going to interject on something else, but um, do, you, do you have any thoughts on that in terms of your sort of, um, you're dealing a lot with uh, natural language uh, processing. Um, any thoughts about that, about how do you maintain the functioning of a system through time, rather than just there's a set point in time and you, you've done all the tick boxes, it works. How do you maintain it in terms of evaluating it? Yeah, I think I was going to make a, a slightly different point, but I think I can shoehorn it in. Um, which is around, especially with text data, ChatGPT isn't just producing result, the output at random. It is basing it on human-generated um, language. And so there is still, I know um, several qualitative analysts who are um, asking if they're going to be out of a job. I would say absolutely not, because we need people who understand how language is used and how people use, so in surveys, if someone gives a response that you might not be expecting, then you can look at what, is the wrong, what happened with the question. Is the question wrong? We're already seeing prompt engineering turn up as a job title, whatever you want to think about that. So I think in terms of sort of the project lifespan or the product lifespan, you need the, the right experts and that doesn't just have to be the machine learning people or the statisticians or the data scientists. If you're using text data or you're using imaging, you know, artwork type data, you need someone who understands how that is being produced and how that is being used throughout, you know, throughout the process, from the data to the prompt to the output. And so having that level of expertise to inform and evaluate. And do you think that um, part of regulation should be around that, that maintenance of, of systems? Oh, God, yes. Yeah. yeah. We talk too much now about we must use automation, we must use pipelines. But the pipelines themselves need to be regularly maintained because otherwise you're looking at a, yet another legacy system mm. because the, the, um, the technology is going to be very quickly become out of date. Yeah. So you need to have that maintenance plan built in from the outset. And with that sort of, that, you know, some of the Elon Musk things and various other people, about, you, know, you know, it could be the, the, the death of us, you know, the AI. I mean, I suppose it's a bit like the sort of nuclear threat, is if you have to build a nuclear power station, but then just leave it. Yeah. Then, you know, you might have a few problems later on. And so the, the, the importance of maintenance, or yeah. even, you know, with drug development, the importance of, of keeping a, a close eye on how it's functioning and performing mm -hmm. and amending it yeah. if required. And again, this is, where, this is why I welcome these discussions around evaluation. It's not just around doing the thing, you know, creating the thing. Um, it's around how do we create this responsibly, how do we create it in such, and maintain it in such a way that is, um, oh God, my brain, sustainable. Okay. And that will develop over time, and then the, the process will evolve over time. Yeah. Now, I'm going to switch a little bit now to um, the second recommendation, which was around open source. And actually, this is an area I'm actually maybe not less convinced about a little bit. I, mean, I think I just don't know enough about it. So I'm really interested to get the panel's views on, on, on open source. So we've called for an, invo an investment in open source. Uh, where should that uh, investment be targeted to further advance the open source ecosystem? So where, where should, if, we, if we're calling for, for more investment, where should it be directed? Peter, do you, want to, do you want to start on that one? Happily. So, so specifically on open source and software and algorithms. The a big, in, so if we think of the, the UK as a whole has a goal of trying to catch up, catch up or keep pace with places like the US and China or India or some of the other very large nations. The, if that is a goal, then one of the directions for open source software should be reducing the need for compute power so smaller models should be reducing the need for very large data sets because the UK does have smaller data sets 
than many of those other geographies. So focusing, expending R&D effort into reducing the scale that's required to build uh, smaller language models, shall we say, let's call them by SLM as we can trademark that name, please put it in a paper. <laughs> the would be a wise investment. I mean, there's another part of our open source of how to make things more explainable or predictable or auditable and verifiable over time, which are other interesting areas. But there's certainly a thing right now about reducing the barrier of entry, particularly if the UK can only afford to buy, I think it's 5% as many of the computer chips as even Elon Musk alone, let alone the rest of the other companies in Silicon Valley. And, and, and do you think then, I mean, because I, I do like the idea of sort of investing more in, in computing power. Um, I mean, this is a question to all the panelists. Um, you know, statistics in, in, in the past has certainly been, you know, random sampling, of course, was, was a means of getting unbiased estimates and not asking, not doing a census, for instance, not asking everybody. Um, do you think we have a role to try and reduce the reliance on computing power by developing better methodology that doesn't require so much, I guess, energy as well moving, moving forward. Uh, I know, I know, Chris, do you, do you want to comment on this from your, your background? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think, so a lot of it is already happening already. So if you look at, say, Microsoft, they have some quite clever innovations to try and reduce the computational cost of how these large language models work. And, and just by looking at simple uh, linear algebra, I mean, most of neural networks is just linear algebra. So there are all sorts of linear algebra tricks you can do. You can make these things a lot faster. I think as statisticians, we also have our own bag of tricks and we can apply and we can certainly make these things much more computationally efficient. And we're going to need that as well because on the one hand, we could say, yes, we want to support open source. And when we think about open source, I think as a community, we tend to think about the R CRAN sort of world. Like, you know, I produce a paper, I upload some package and everyone can use the package and that's great. And the stats community has been great at open source. But the problem is that in the AI world, having the code is only half the problem because the other bigger half is the computation. Um, and which what Peter was mentioning earlier, is that you need to have access to these um, GPUs or TPUs, whatever it might be. And so the question is, where's the hardware going to come from? I mean, I could go home and I could code up my own transformer, and maybe I could make, create my own little version of ChatGPT, but it's not going to be any good, because in order for it to be good, I need it to be massive, and I need to have the computational resources in, either, in order to sort of train that sort of model. So I think how we support computation is a really interesting sort of question. But on software more broadly, <clears throat> there's an interesting aspect, I guess, about AI and how you regulate it, how you evaluate it, compared to, say, nuclear or medical, which was sort of mentioned earlier. So if you have, say, a nuclear program, okay, it's not easy to build a nuclear bomb. I can't go home and do it in my back garden, right? I mean, you need lots of resources, you need access to things, you need specialists and scientists. Same in the medical world as well. I can't just start making drugs in my back garden. Um, my, my garden's not that big. I don't make drugs and bombs <laughs> in my back garden. But I mean, you, you need lots of people. It requires lots of resources. But in the AI world, it's very different. It's much more focused focused on software. If someone, for example, uh, copied the uh, ChatGPT code, it's about two or three gigabytes maybe, not that large. If someone you know, wanted to, who were to open AI, they could just release that and it could be all around the world in a few seconds. Right? Everyone has access to this amazing AI system. Okay? And that's a big difference, I think, when you're talking about software compared to sort of like hardware. Um, so how we regulate that, I think is gonna be a lot more tricky. So that's, that is actually a bit of a risk on the open source side as well. So I'm glad to hear you're not developing crystal meth in your uh, back garden. I didn't say I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> For the benefit of the tape. Yeah. <laughs> so, so any, any comments around um, this, this sort of open source? So we've got this nice, nice distinction here between the investment in the, in the computational power and the, um, and the actual code itself. Um, and you mentioned R, which would be familiar, obviously, to, to a lot of people at, at the conference. I mean, any thoughts about maybe going back to the code? I mean, does there need to be you know, what sort of gatekeeping does there need to be around uh, the code? Because R is, I mean, R is, is open source, but it, it is, there is a, a consortium that manages R. So, I mean, any thoughts about even how, how an open source AI on the code side would be, would be managed? Anybody who likes, Sophie? Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to slightly answer that, but, so R, when I first learned, was really intimidating because it was just a little flashing dot on a screen, and now it looks quite nice. But I think there is a part, as I said at the start, which comes to the software, if from open source, we can massively open access to more people from across a huge, diverse range of backgrounds to become involved in the code development 
I think that actually starts to not reduce the need for the gatekeepers, but it means it's got a broader base. So I think a lot of the worries about some of the um, evaluations we've been talking about and making sure that it is fair and bi unbiased and transparent, at the moment, not everybody codes, and maybe not everybody wants to, to code, but reducing the barrier to entry because you can easily access cheap computational power or because you've got an easier way to learn to code or you've got open source code, much more open source AI code that you can learn to tinker with, because I certainly learned by basically going on GitHub with some lovely person who put up a bit of code and Stack Overflow was my savior because you can take it and tweak it and learn that way. And if we can open it up so that just everybody can have a go, I think actually we'll get a much better set of AI coming out, but then maybe I'm just a, an optimist. I mean, does it, I'll just yeah. add something to that. So I think that you're absolutely right. So if you look at the, big, the biggest benefit of open sourcing something, and this is what Meta are arguing at the moment. So Meta have released their large language model called Llama, and they, well, they had no choice but because it kind of got out anyway. But now they say they're, they're very pro-open source. Um, and they say the reason they're doing it is because the more people who look at it, the more people can find bugs in the code, right? And if you're working at OpenAI or Google and you have a, a team of a, even a 1,000 engineers, there's so much code there. Is, do you actually have enough eyeballs on the code to make sure that it isn't biased or that it's working correctly? So this is a big advantage of open source. More of us can look at it, more of us can improve it. But also, going back to what Maxime was saying at the very beginning about ordinate survey maps, if these things are open source and kind of the way that, say, the internet is open, then people can build on top of that. And that leads into you know, better results for the economy, more businesses, um, better returns on, say, healthcare and lots of other things. Because if we don't open source it, then the other side is you just let Google own it all and they make all the money, which is nice for them, but it doesn't actually improve everybody else's lives and it doesn't stimulate the economy more broadly. Yeah, it's an interesting point again. You know, I, I'm in drug development, and, and we use, uh, traditionally use SaaS, and there's a, there's a big movement towards R. And the question always with SaaS has been, can you, can you validate SaaS? Can you actually get under the code, under the hood, and see, see what's happening? And you, you can't really. And I think what, why people have moved more towards using R in a, in, a valid, in a validated way is essentially because you get innovation quicker, and you've got a whole community of people checking it. And so almost your validation, it might not be officially validated quite so well, but, but unofficially, it's probably much better validated because people are trying it out all the time, et cetera. Um, you were going to come up with a comment? A, a comment, um, not a solution, though, and something to just kind of raise, is that public sector, we don't have um, free access to the internet. We are working behind a firewall. And similarly with um, a lot of the large language models and AI, tools, we don't have access to them, and we don't, we can't even access um, training data for non-AI purposes, you know, if we want to do a, an online tutorial or something that uses a CSV file, we can't access that. So as we are developing these open source tools, which I'm a big fan of, um, we need to be mindful that these also need to work behind, um, with all systems. Great, thank you. Um, Brian, do we have any questions coming through yet? We do, brilliant, okay. So I, I've got a, a, a fine, I'm gonna leave the last maybe uh, two, three minutes at the, at the end just to ask a, a final question, but I'm gonna hand over to Brian uh, and see whether it's stimulated lots of, uh, lots of questions. There's lots of questions and I'm, I'll, I'll broadly go through in order of the ones that have that had most upvotes. But, uh, so the t top one is, AI will impact all of us. How can we ensure that the least empowered in society can have control over both its good and bad consequences. Who'd like to pick up on that one? Sophie. So, uh, thank you, that, that goes back to my opening statement. We have to somehow find a way to communicate and engage with everybody. And, and that falls a lot on us to improve our communications and find ways to make everybody want to care about why AI, machine learning, and algorithms is impacting their life, but to understand that impact. Because if they don't understand the impact, they're going to get left behind. And if they get left behind, that is when, unfortunately, they are likely to end up being missing from the models and not having a say. So, and I can see you're coming in. But th that, that is my point, is that we have to find a way of communicating and, and engaging every portion of society in why they care and what it means. Right, but a yes and is for, for groups who are historically unheard, it can be very hard because it, uh, I was 
I do, I, do, I do work with some of those groups sometimes, and you find people who cannot engage because they're, fi they're just fighting to put food on the table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're yep. fighting against the fear of, un fear of unjust, unjust deportation, deportation under the Windrush scandal, etc. So there's a, it's a real challenge because things are moving so fast, and there are people who will keep moving fast because they care less about this issue than people like ourselves do. But what we can do to, uh, in some cases, to slow things down so it can go at the pace of the people who should be have an equal place at the table, the same as everybody else, I think is also an important element of it, and recognising the, ch the challenges and the barriers some of, the, some of those groups face. Yeah. Without wanting to disempower anybody, et cetera, et cetera, language in this space is really hard. It, it is, and I think one of the things is we can't shy away from those hard conversations, because yeah. if we don't have them, they won't even start. Mm. Yeah. Does anybody else want to come in on that question? There's a, a quote that I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember the exact thing, which is that new tech needs to include minoritized groups in how it is used. Um, for example, GPS on, on phones, and everyone's like, oh my god, this is great, you can track your runs. And women's groups were saying, an abusive partner can use that to track me. Mm. So we need, we need to be including these groups as a way, of not just how can this make your life better, but what are we missing? How, how could this make your life worse? that we can now be in introducing as much as we can. Hey Brian, another question? Yeah, next question. People tend to throw around the term AI. How would you define the boundaries of AI as of today? Computers. <laughs> <laughs> Very succinct. I'll, I'll take big computers, lots of data, and actually lots of statistics. Autonomous agents with computers. <laughs> Any other definitions? No, okay. I, I, do, I, mean, maybe just point me out. I do think, um, you know, one of, the, one of the points we made, I think it was Maxine, with, with the distinction between, and we've always had algorithms, you know, whether it's been uh, sending your, your children to which school, how, how they select children for schools and things like that. We've always used al algorithms. Um, so, you know, what, what is the difference? And I do think it, it is partly about the probabilistic models, the, probabilistic, the stochastic element of it, which is, to me, is, is slightly unique. And then you get into the nuances around that. But I think the stochastic element, is, is certainly key. And around decision making, it's often, you know, you're often feeding, you, you, if you think about, and we, I, I work a lot with, um, with, with government data as well on, on, on data linkage, a large data set. So de de large data sets have been used for a long time, but still produce estimates and aggregates versus putting new data through and getting a, a decision at the end or a recommendation at the end. And I, I sort of see that a little bit as a distinction. I probably shouldn't have commented because I'm chairing up panel like that. <laughs> anyway, that, that's my view. I would add to that that the AI, if I'm being cynical, I guess as a cynical evangelist, <laughs> um, iRobot doesn't actually exist, but I think people feel that AI is magic, and it's not. So I think that would be the definition, my definition at the moment, is that iRobot doesn't exist. We might get there, but not right now. Maths, statistics, that's what we've got right now. Okay, um, this one, brings us back to the early discussion of inputs. How do we overcome the bias, underrepresentation, and mis stroke disinformation in data sources that are used by algorithms and AI models? I, I have a question for the panel, <laughs> which is tied to this. It comes from a, a conversation I was having with a colleague of mine, uh, Katie Davis, who's in the audience. Hi, Katie. Uh, she is one of the um, uh, sample design and estimation experts in uh, methods and data quality. She was talking about how um, weighting isn't used widely outside of public sector. Could we, do you think that we could use weighting to reduce some of the bias in text data, for example? Have I broken the panel? <laughs> <laughs> Not really an easy question to answer, is it? <laughs> um, you can answer the first one as well as it came through. So I would love to say yes, and I'm going to say but. Mm. And going back to the question that Brian asked, it reminded me of something David Spiegelhalter said, that a lot of statistics people think is dull and boring because it's the hard work that doesn't get 
the glory. Mm. And actually, answering Brian's question is, you have got to spend time going through that data set until you understand it inside and out. You've got to know what's missing, and then you've got to put the effort in to get the stuff that's missing. That's not quick, it's not easy, and it's not cheap. But it is the dull hard work. I don't think it's dull. I really like it because I find it quite mindful doing things like that. But that's the part you've got to do. That's the 99.9% .9 grunt work, which then produces this amazing AI algorithm output at the end. So I don't know necessarily about the weightings, but I do know the answer to Brian's question is just to put the really hard, deep work in over and over and over again until you've got the data, unless somebody's got an amazing answer to your question about the weighting. And this is not, again, this isn't an exact answer either, but I think in the private sector, a lot of the focus is towards large data sets and increasing the size of that data set. And they think that will overcome the problem. Mm. Mm. So I've done work with a, a very, very large firm in this space, and their approach to it was to build products that were more inclusive so they would collect data from more diverse groups of people. Right. That was the only way forward they could see in the way their mindset and corporation worked. Mm. So to have a bigger funnel at the top, which is more attractive, would attract more people, get more data, dot, 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 less bias. I was skeptical, mm -hmm. shall we say. But having more products which are more inclusive, it's a good thing. Yeah. So that part, useful, regardless of whether or not it actually ends up reducing bias in the resulting algorithms or data sets. My, my feeling is that there's no like, AI solution to this problem. I think the solution is that you need humans to be involved, you need a diverse group of people to be involved, not just statisticians and computer scientists, but ethicists and philosophers and all sorts of different people when designing these systems. Because the problem is that if you're, say, a recruitment company and you want to design an AI system to find the best candidate, if all the data you have are just men, you stick that in, then the AI system says, well, choose that man for the job. The AI system doesn't turn to you and say, well, hang on a minute, there are only men in my data set, right? The AI system doesn't know this. This is for us as humans to sort of um, query this make sure the right data goes in. So I feel like we as humans are still going to have to play a very, very important role in creating and doing the hard graft, as sort of Sophie was saying, in terms of getting these data sets right at the input stage. So I think all data is um, subjective in nature. It's not always as objective as you think. Um, the way that data is collected and curated and how um, census, for example, is curated it looks objective, but in some ways, it's how society defines what the data is. And understanding your data and the um, repercussions of that definitions of what the society defined A, B, or C makes your first, again, granting your data, thinking about your model, what your data goes in, that's very important. Um, and again, coming to your point, in the private sector, the first important thing that everyone thinks about is accuracy. It's never fairness or unbiased or transparency. It's always accuracy. Um, unless there's another driver that goes into the modeling or the data science teams or the companies, um, fairness is usually never the first goal until there's um, repercussions, for example, like the um, sensitive attributes. If your model is used for non um, numbers related and more of like society related applications like um, loans for example um, yeah yeah I mean, just a quick comment for me as well I mean you know even you would look at say reported crime versus the national crime survey to realize that the data is important and you, you to pick up Sophie's point you've got to invest time thinking about where the data is being generated the data generating process it's really key on, on these things in terms of representation um, Next question. Yeah, and uh, I don't want to be biased against people who aren't using the app, so if there are any hands want to go up to ask a question, we do have mics at the front, uh, so feel free to put yourself forward for that. But uh, in the meantime, I will ask, uh, how do you trust an LLM to answer facts directly without validation prior to dissemination? Uh, I think this is a question that taps into that whole issue of hallucination and how do we deal with a hallucination problem, which seems to be a difficult thing, if not impossible, to solve. Who'd like to pick that up? So, start, the, start things going there, uh, which is uh, one, you only trust, certainly only trust it to a certain level. Hallucinations are 
seem like they're they could well be impossible to fix with the current technology and, a and methods that are being used is one. Uh, two, in the outputs from an LLM, communicating confidence is a very useful thing to do at whatever level it might be. The ONS's recent thing around searching mm -hmm. uh, for statistics had a lovely... I was showing that with lots of people who were very happy to see it showing confidence scores and explaining how it had got to results to communicate to the user how to make decisions was a good thing. And the third bit is don't, you don't need to use an LLM, LLM on its own. Most systems will include an, an AI algorithm like an, like an LLM, lookup databases, this and that and the other. You can combine these things together and say, if you're asked this kind of question, look it up over here. If you ask this kind of question, generate it using a probabilistic or non-deterministic or stochastic, I'm going to learn all the words, <laughs> or approach which has a confidence level. So you can look these things, you can build systems that combine different elements. There was another uh, government department um, who did a very nice presentation on the evaluation metrics that they're using with their large language models. And all of them had a human element to the evaluation. So at the moment, yeah, it's very much still using it with a realistic degree of confidence, but you still need that human element. And we've talked before about the need for a diverse um, evaluation group, ethicists, linguists, etc. So we're we'll we'll making an interesting uh, <clears throat> additional point. Um, so yes, I think humans are the solution, absolutely. Humans, they need to be in the loop. But what's quite funny sometimes, if you use ChatGPT, you ask it a question, it gives you an answer. You ask it afterwards at the end, have you told me the truth? It'll say, no. <laughs> <laughs> and so it is possible that we might be able to create AI systems which can basically check other AI systems. And this is something which is, goes, in, to some extent, kind of goes back to the sort of 2013 sort of ge uh, GANs, generative adversarial networks. We have two, two neural networks kind of fight against each other. Um, so it is possible that we will be able to develop AI systems which sort of monitor the AI systems. Just picking up on what you both said, I think, again, this goes back to almost a time element b before chat GPT. And in fact, I went to university before the internet, when you actually had to go and read a load of things and make your own opinions. I think one of the issues is that now the world runs at such a speed. Mm -hmm. The quick answer is I ask chat GPT or Claude. And, and it comes up, and that's great. And I haven't really got time to check it, so I might do a quick Google. But there it's, there it's great, and it goes in. And actually finding a way to slow down the pace of work, to let people do the hard work so that they can check and focus and triple check, actually starts to build some of the trust we're talking about and lets people start to evaluate what's happening. And I think part of my role increasingly at work is to, I, I refer to myself as Gandalf, thou shalt not pass. Mm -hmm. And you just stand there and say, no, people need time. You can have a very quick answer, but it'll probably be wrong. But if you have time to do the proper evaluations and the research, you're going to get a much more in-depth answer that you might want to, to use a lot more. Great. Brian, if it's OK, I'm going to move on to one final question. So thank you very much for the, the audience questions. So um, we've, we've got about five minutes left. Um, Global AI Summit is being held in the autumn of winter of this year. What do you hope to see emerge from this gathering? So maybe we'll start, um, we'll start with Karen. Start from this end. I think more joined up working. There are still a lot of different groups who are doing the, th doing the regulation for a particular um, sector or for a particular area. So that, that's one. There is, as, um, as you previously said, there is no center, central point for AI in, in the UK or elsewhere. Um, my focus is, is always going to be on how is, the, how is it going to work within an organization or how is the organization going to evaluate its use of AI. So that's something that I would like to see as well. Okay, great. Um, and waiting, obviously, to reduce <laughs> bias. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, Chris, uh, what, what would you hope to see emerge from this gathering? Um, so I guess... 
uh, what we do, okay, the ideal situation, I guess, would be all governments of the world come together and say, here's what the um, sort of international regulations are going to be on uh, AI, and we're all going to sign up to it like some sort of UN charter. Right? That would be the ideal situation. But it's very, very unlikely because different governments have different priorities and they're willing to use AI in different ways. I mentioned this EU bill, for example, where the EU say you can't use AI for facial recognition. Okay? Other countries around the world will say, fine, we want to do that. We're more than happy to use facial recognition. Um, so I think to have some sort of international agreement is unlikely. I think what I would like to see is some progress made towards the important things, like AI in terms of like biological weapons, AI for military use, um, the, these sort of big ones where I think most countries could probably agree on. I think if we can get some of those agreed early on, then that might actually set the groundwork to then develop international regulations uh, in other areas of AI going forward. Sophie, your hopes? So, my hopes. Um, and fears, maybe? <laughs> not so much fears. No, my hope, genuinely, I, I'd like a really honest discussion. A really honest discussion. So, there's a lot of hype around AI, and I do think AI has a lot of potential. But some genuine, honest discussions around use cases. What's the AI being designed for? Going back, back to the risks. What can it actually genuinely do? right now, AI, that is not machine learning or good old-fashioned statistics. And if we have those honest discussions about where we are, what we want to use it for, and where it might go, then we start to answer, I think, a lot of the questions we've got now. So I would hope that the hype is put to one side and genuine, honest discussions happen. Thank you. Uh, Maxine. Um, I think I hope to see some consensus coming up from the summit. There's a lot of global leaders coming, and the consensus can vary from as simple as what, def what is the definition of AI? Again, is it machine learning, statistics, or actual artificial intelligence? Um, drawing up on similar um, issues like climate change, one of the biggest consensus is that there is climate change happening. And that kind of simple consensus can drive so much more discussions that could be actionable after the summit. Um, so that and probably um, like steps forward from principles like one of the most agreed upon principles on AI is OECD AI principles and what is the implementation of that looks like what is that going forward going to look like thank you um, and finally uh, Peter cool so I suppose uh, three things one is a less talk about the mostly imaginary existential risks from artificial general intelligence. There's been a lot of that the last year. Less, less of that would be good. Uh, two more, more practical things right now in actually, actually building services that can, can improve people's lives and society or actually stopping the harms that are currently caused by AI. There's a lot of very practical things right now that aren't being done because of the hype machine. There's a thing that sticks stuck in my head from last week where a government minister put out a press a UK government minister put out a press release talking about drones that would deliver medicines to people at risk of drug, drug overdoses as a way of reducing drug deaths and this was a use of AI and it's like please can we stop talking about these very very made up things which can also be really scary because those drones flying around will terrify me so more practical things that catch due to improve people's lives and reduce harms and I think three my biggest hope is that the roof just doesn't fall down because we're hosting it in the UK in a public building so <laughs> we've not got a great track record right now I'll let you join the dots here you introduced lots of topics we've got climate change concrete everything here okay brilliant um, I think that's the end of the session so I'd like to thank uh, Sophie Chris Maxine Karen and Peter uh, I think that's been a, an excellent discussion. I think we've solved all the AI problems in, 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 in an hour and 20. Uh, and I'd really like to thank uh, Jonathan and Brian as well for being the architects of, of this meeting and uh, bringing it all together and uh, bringing all the panelists together. So if you could give a round of applause, please, to the panel and the organizers. Thank you. Thank you.